This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Judge Juan Marchand, who is overseeing Trump's so-called hush money case, says Trump can testify on his own behalf. Marchand started the trial day today by saying that the gag order on Trump does not prevent him from testifying. The judge appeared to respond to comments Trump made after the trial the day before. Trump said he was not allowed to testify due to the gag order. The judge said in court, quote, the order restricting extrajudicial statements does not prevent you from testifying in any way. Before walking into court today, Trump clarified his earlier comments. He said that the gag order doesn't stop him from testifying in the case, but instead stops him from talking about people and responding when they say things about me. Criminal defendants have a constitutional right to take the stand and cannot be forced to incriminate themselves. Day 11 saw Trump mostly sit in a courtroom listening to claims about how his 2016 campaign reacted to the Access Hollywood tape weeks before the presidential election. Prosecutors attempting to show the jury the campaign's efforts to block damaging stories. For most of the day, Trump's former communications director testifying. Here's our legal correspondent, Arlene Richards. So now I have to go through this trial day after day. Tonight, the prosecution closing out the second week of testimony by offering the jury a peek into how the Trump 2016 campaign handled damage control from one of the people who best knows how it worked. The prosecution called Hope Hicks, the former communications director during the Trump administration. Hicks confirming she helped to suppress negative stories about Trump ahead of the 2016 election and that she mobilized the entire team after learning that a damaging Access Hollywood tape would soon be released. What is the Access Hollywood tape? In 2016, shortly before Trump was elected president, the Washington Post released a video of Trump making lewd remarks about women. Hicks testified that before it was released, she received an email from the reporter who would later publish a damaging article asking for comment. She forwarded the news in an email to senior campaign staff and wrote, deny, deny, deny. The prosecution looking to show the jury that the campaign was more than willing to bury damaging stories. At the heart of this case is the $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels. The district attorney says Trump tried to cover it up to influence the campaign by labeling reimbursement payments to Michael Cohen as legal fees. But Hicks later confirmed the defense's argument that Trump was concerned about his family's reaction, at one point saying President Trump really values Mrs. Trump's opinion, and that he was concerned about what the perception of that would be. Hicks couldn't offer the prosecution any testimony on the actual crime the former president has been indicted for, which is the way his payments to Cohen were documented on his internal records. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The Bureau of Labor Statistics just released April's jobs report, showing the economy added just 175,000 jobs last month, lower than what experts predicted. This marks the slowest growth since October. Economists have been anticipating a slowdown in the labor market from the pressure of high interest rates. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate ticked higher from 3.8% to 3.9. April marked the 27th consecutive month. The jobless number stayed under 4%, a streak last seen in the late 1960s. Annual wage growth also slowed to 3.9%. It was the first time this figure fell below 4% in nearly three years. President Biden and former President Trump clashing in their reactions to the new jobs report. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. So the two presidential candidates are using the new jobs numbers, which were weaker than expected but still solid, to attack each other. And President Biden in a Friday statement says the numbers show the great American comeback continues while noting that he inherited, quote, the worst economic crisis in a century. And Biden also says he's fighting for Scranton, not Park Avenue. And that's again to make the point that Biden himself is working for average Americans while Trump is working for billionaires. And Trump, meanwhile, speaking outside the court, Room in New York today called the job numbers horrible. Numbers, and the job numbers just came out and they're horrible. And they're very, and I say that not happily, I say that very unhappily. But the numbers are horrible. It's just uh, these people are destroying our country. Here's another sign of it. 
A cooler job market, though, could be exactly what the Federal Reserve is hoping to see as a trend to tame inflation. The new report fueling hopes of an interest rate cut sends stocks higher on Friday. And that's not the only economic issue that Biden and Trump are fighting for today. The White House announced on Friday that it's expanding access to health insurance for about 100,000 DACA recipients. And Trump's campaign responded saying Biden's forcing struggling Americans to pay for the health care of illegal immigrants. And Biden, meanwhile, says in a Friday statement that DACA recipients or DREAMers, too, deserve the same promise to health care just as other Americans. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. Today, more arrests at the New York University and the new school in New York City. A student tells NTD's Fiona G that she feels safer with the protest encampment taken down. I'm right here outside the John A. Paulson Center of New York University, where earlier today around 6 a.m., the New York Police Department cleared out a pro-Palestinian student encampment right there behind me. The police department said that the university sent them a letter yesterday asking for their help. Now things seem to have quieted down. There's no more tents or protesters in the area. Workers earlier were hosing down the sidewalks with power hoses. As I was walking here, I noticed pro-Palestinian slogans written on the ground in chalk, but no more protesters in sight. Despite the unrest, NYU announced that classes will continue as scheduled. Increased safety measures require students to scan their IDs to enter facilities. Police continue to patrol outside NYU buildings. I don't think it's necessary, personally. And I feel like it kind of increases the tensions around campus, makes everyone a little bit more stressed. Nationwide, over 2,300 Israel-Hamas war protesters have been arrested on college campuses. This morning, the new school in New York City also requested police assistance. The NYPD then arrested 43 individuals. A lot of the tents had things that were anti-Semitic. Once again, everyone should be able to peacefully protest whatever their opinion is. But specifically with that, it was harming a lot of students, whether they realized it or not. So I feel more safe as a student walking around campus that is take, that's taken down. It is reported that around a dozen people were arrested at the encampment this morning. Now, tonight in this building right here, there's going to be a Shabbat dinner, which is one of NYU's largest annual gatherings of Jewish students. Pro-Palestinian student protesters say they will return at that time. Fiona G, NTD News. And on the West Coast, the Chancellor of University of California, Los Angeles, addresses the community after the chaotic events that unfolded on campus this week. And the University of Southern California unveils new plans to honor their 2024 graduates. NTD's Christina Corona has more on the updates. UCLA resumed remote classes and limited campus operations Friday after over 200 arrests were made during the removal of a pro-Palestinian encampment. In a lengthy press release, UCLA Chancellor Jean Block addressed the arrests and violence that occurred on the campus earlier this week. Demonstrators directly interfered with instruction by blocking students' pathways to classrooms. Indirectly, violence related to the encampment led to the closure of academic buildings and the cancellation of classes. He goes on to say, in the end, the encampment on Roy's quad was both unlawful and a breach of policy. Block expressed hope for a return to a safe and connected campus community. He added counseling and psychological services are available for those in need. However, in response to safety concerns, USC revealed alternate plans for honoring the class of 2024. USC has scheduled the Trojan Family Graduate Celebration for Thursday, May 9th at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Graduates are given up to six tickets each for the event, which will feature drone shows, fireworks, surprise performances, the Trojan marching band, and a gift for the graduates. The decision to cancel USC's main commencement followed a series of pro-Palestinian protests that unfolded across college campuses nationwide. Christina Corona, NTD News. Israel continues to face pressure from many sides to end the war in the Gaza Strip, including a new threat from the Houthi terrorist group in Yemen that says Israel's prime minister vowed to return all the hostages still held by Hamas. Entity's Jason Perry has the war update.
as protests spread across American universities. Tens of thousands took to the streets in Yemen on Friday in support of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. The crowd chanted, the Red Sea is blocked. The Iran-backed Houthi terrorist group in Yemen has been firing at ships in the Red Sea that it thinks are headed to Israel as a show of support for the Palestinian people. During the rally, a spokesman for the Houthis said that if Israel proceeds with ground operations in Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip, then the Houthis would expand their operations. But it remains unclear exactly how the Houthis would carry out the threat. Despite that, Israel's prime minister says he remains undeterred in achieving Israel's main objectives in the war, which are defeating Hamas, ensuring Gaza will no longer be a threat to Israel, and returning all the hostages. We are making great efforts. We have already returned half, and I can tell you that we are determined to return everyone, the ones who are alive as well as the ones who are dead. And family members of those hostages continue to feel the pain every day. They protested outside of Israel's Ministry of Defense building on Thursday. And many are placing their hopes in the latest ceasefire proposal, which Hamas officials are currently reviewing. If the army will go inside Haifa, we're probably going to lose most of the hostages over there, and we, we must have deal before Rafa. Rafa needs to be after, after a deal. And in Rafa, residents searched through rubble after an apparent Israeli airstrike, which they said killed several people. There are civilians and children dying. Children are sleeping in their houses, safely with nothing happening, and then suddenly there are strikes and they die for no reason. And in another development, Turkey said they've stopped trading with Israel until a permanent ceasefire in Gaza is secured and unhindered humanitarian aid flow to the region. Jason Perry, NTD News. Russia is making itself heard on TikTok. According to a recent study by the Brookings Institution, Russian state-affiliated accounts have boosted their presence on the video platform ahead of the U.S. presidential election. Such accounts are also active on other social media platforms and have a larger presence on Telegram and X. However, user engagement, including likes, views and shares on their posts, has been much higher on TikTok. According to the study, most posts focus on the war in Ukraine and NATO instead of U.S. politics. The posts about the U.S. are aimed to be divisive. They include topics like Washington's policy toward Israel and Russia and concerns about President Biden's age. Staying in Russia, Moscow authorities today raided the homes of Falun Gong practitioners, a group heavily persecuted by the Chinese communist regime. The White House National Security Council just put out a statement, quote, the United States has continued to speak out against religious persecution of groups, including the Falun Gong. It adds, we are concerned about this, whether it happens in China or Russia or elsewhere in the world. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a traditional Chinese spiritual practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion and forbearance. The home search is just the latest in Russia's escalating campaign targeting Falun Gong amid the country's closer ties with communist China. Joining me now to discuss the home raids is Levi Browdy, executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center, which just put out an urgent appeal about the detained practitioners. Levi, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you again. To begin, what exactly happened in Russia and who are the people arrested? Well, it looked like essentially uh, home raids. Um, and we know this because there's there's very clear footage that's been going out over Russian state run media and other news outlets. So they made very big news about this, but they basically bang, banged in the doors of several residences of people who practice Falun Gong in Russia, um, brutally kind of manhandling them to the floor, arresting some of them. I think uh, the footage that you're showing here, um, they they had grabbed actually a young man who happens to be the brother of a Falun Gong practitioner, not, not a Falun Gong practitioner. But this is a very aggressive, far more than we've ever seen in any other country outside of China, uh, uh, effort to arrest uh, some Falun Gong practitioners. And Levi, in your view, why did Russia do this? Well, I think the the most obvious reason would be, you know, 
going after Falun Gong internationally, certainly in China, but internationally is, has always been a top priority of the CCP. And so one of the best ways to get in the good graces of the CCP is to malign Falun Gong, is to go after Falun Gong. And, and clearly that would be one motivation, probably the top motivation for doing anything like this, because these are really just, again, there's your people that are meditating, uh, learning principles to try and help themselves be a better person. Really, the only viable reason would be some sort of um, attempt to befriend and strengthen a tie with Beijing. Zooming out a bit, Russia's war against Ukraine has caused a much larger rift between Russia and the West. Now, a result of this has been growing ties between Russia and China. Levi, on that note, talk to us about the risks associated with countries deepening their ties with the Chinese regime. Well, the pattern is very clear, whether it's been the series of countries of the Belt and Road Initiative over the last many years. The math is very simple. The closer a country gets to the CCP, the more they are apt to misbehave on the international stage, whether it's you know breaking down homes and violating the, the freedom of speech, the freedom of belief of people in Russia, or other activities. Um, that, that math has always been very simple. The closer regime is to China, the more they are apt to act like the Chinese regime, going after dissidents of the Chinese regime, going after people who um, are speaking out against the tyranny of the CCP. And, and unfortunately, I think that's what we're really seeing here in Russia. On that note of what we're seeing in Russia, where could this lead? What's the impact? What is likely to happen next here? Well, I think two things come to mind. I mean, first is the freedom of belief and speech of Russian people. I mean, if they're going to use some of these vague sort of uh, rules that have been put in place over the last several years, but they're using against the Falun Gong practitioners here, I, I don't think anybody's safe. Because um, again, if they're going to go after peaceful meditators, who else might they go after? So I think that's one one problem. And the second problem is that as countries, again, get closer to China, if they start to behave more and more like the CCP, that's really bad for the rest of us on the international stage. If you have more countries behaving like that, we're going to have a much, much bigger problem. We already have our hands full with the CCP and the transnational repression it propagates. If other countries start behaving in kind, I think we're all in real trouble. Levi Browdy, Executive Director of the Paul Mandapa Information Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar of Texas and his wife have been indicted on conspiracy and bribery charges. The Justice Department says the case involves the couple's ties to Mexico and Azerbaijan. The indictment says Cuellar and his wife accepted nearly $600,000 in bribes from an Azerbaijan-controlled energy company and a bank in Mexico from 2014 to 2021. In exchange, Cuellar allegedly agreed to help Azerbaijan and the Mexican bank by advancing their interests in Congress. Cuellar was at one time the co-chair of the Congressional Azerbaijan Caucus. The indictment says Cuellar agreed to influence bills favorable to Azerbaijan and deliver a pro-Azerbaijan speech on the House floor. Federal disclosures show that the congressman traveled to Azerbaijan in 2013. Two years later, Cuellar's office announced an agreement between a Texas university and an organization called the Assembly of Friends of Azerbaijan. The Justice Department said the couple surrendered to authorities today and were taken into custody. Famed attorney Alan Dershowitz talked to NTD's Kelly Wright, the host of America's Hope. Dershowitz says Trump's so-called hush money trial is a case about a non-crime and the criminal justice system is being weaponized against the former president. You've uh, defended Donald Trump before, the former president of the United States. Uh, he is facing a lot of legal trouble as he continues to be the front runner for the Republican Party, the presumptive nominee. What's happening in his legal uh, quagmire? Well, I wrote a whole book on that called Get Trump. It's not my title. I got it from the Attorney General of New York and the District Attorney of New York, both of whom campaigned on the promise essentially to get Trump. So the legal system is being misused horribly in New York, in, in Georgia, in Florida, uh, and in the District of Columbia. And uh, I'm not a Republican. I did not vote for Trump in the last uh, election. I don't know who I'm gonna vote for in this election, but I have an open mind. But this is not about politics for me. This is about the rule of law. And today it's used against a Republican nominee. Tomorrow it can be used against a Democratic nominee, and the day after it could be used against you and your family. So 
we have to protect the rule of law, even based on selfishness. Um, you know, if, if, if we don't protect it for others, they won't protect it for us. And would you say that all of the uh, recriminations coming against Donald Trump from the legal system, including judges trying to uh, actually force him to be quiet with a gag order, a $9,000 fine, uh, is any of this fair to the former president of the United States, who right now is like any average human being uh, facing a legal system that is uh, coming against him in, in multiple states, as you just stated? utterly unfair. If they wanted to have a gag order, they should have postponed it until after the election. Uh, you don't have a gag order on somebody who's running for president of the United States. A gag order that allows uh, Michael Cohen, his main adversary, to attack him every day, and he's not allowed to respond or not allowed to, pol to campaign. I mean, he's entitled, I mean, President Biden uh, made a joke about him at the uh, 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 journalist dinner. He's entitled to respond to that. The marketplace of ideas requires that every accusation, every statement be responded to. And so the gag order is utterly unconstitutional. The trial is based on a non-crime. The only purpose of the trial is to gag him and to keep him in court to prevent him from campaigning. That's the goal and it's working. And we have some breaking news. The president of Columbia University broke her silence on the protests. In a video message, she said the past two weeks were among the most difficult in Colombia's history. She went on to say, quote, the turmoil and tension, division and disruption have impacted the entire community and that students paid a high price by not being able to attend classes or stay in dorms. The president said Colombia should be a community that feels safe for everyone and that the protesters crossed the line with the occupation of Hamilton Hall. She said this puts students at risk. A bill that received overwhelming support in the House this week is in the spotlight as it heads to the Senate. NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley has more on a bill aimed at targeting anti-Semitism. The House passed the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act overwhelmingly this week, but there was still considerable opposition. 320 members of Congress voted for the bill, but 70 Democrats and 21 Republicans voted against it. The bill faces an uncertain future in the Senate, and critics say that if it becomes law, it could be used to crack down on free speech. Speech that is critical of Israel alone does not constitute unlawful discrimination. The bill sweeps too broadly. Democratic Congressman Jerry Nadler, one of the longest serving Jewish members of the House, voted against the bill because it uses the definition of anti-Semitism from the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. The definition calls anti-Semitism, quote, a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. The bill would use that definition to enforce anti-discrimination laws. It would also apply to companies that receive federal tax dollars. Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene also voted against the bill. She said it could be used against Christians for believing certain Bible texts. Supporters of the bill say it's in response to the rise in anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses. The bill now heads to the Senate, where it's unclear if it will be picked up or passed, after which it will need the president's signature. Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations, None of this is a peaceful protest. President Biden is set to speak about anti-Semitism at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum next week. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Joining me now to discuss the act is Jonathan Houlihan, General Counsel and Director of Legal Operations at Citizens Defending Freedom. Jonathan, thanks for joining us. Good to see you again. Now, the House passed the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act in a bipartisan vote. It's now waiting in the Senate. Now, Congressman Mike Lawler, who introduced the bill, said on the House floor, quote, it is absurd to oppose this, that it somehow limits free speech, adding that calling for death to Jews isn't protected speech, it's anti-Semitic. What is your analysis of this bill? Well, this is an interesting bill. I mean, you have conservatives and progressives that really band together in a lot of circumstances under the banner of free speech, which I agree in, in some circumstances, and here's why. I mean, if you look at the Constitution, uh, First Amendment, Congress shall make up no law bridging the freedom of the press uh, or of, of freedom of speech. So that's the First Amendment. Um, some of the critics of this bill have said it's too broad. Free, free speech will be chilled. 
uh, and it really is outside the boundaries of the First Amendment. That being said, this is really content-based restriction, and that's okay sometimes, right? Whether it's obscenity, uh, advocacy for breaking laws, uh, convincing people to break laws, commit mayhem, all of those things are exceptions to uh, the, to the First Amendment. Fighting words, violence, so it kind of falls in that bucket. Now, the issue is, is this content-based restriction with this bill narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest? That's kind of the case law where it falls. And I would say, I would agree that it is a little broad using this definition, um, and they should tailor it down a little more narrow to be very specific that these fighting words are calling for criminal activity. What we've seen on these campuses is adherent. It's uh, it, it's not free speech. It's violence. It's not letting uh, Jewish students pass. All of those things are not protected speech. So I get the aim of the bill, but we got to be very careful when the government is trying to compel uh, some some type of content based restriction. Expanding on the critics side, Congressman Jerry Nadler called the bill misguided, adding that by effectively codifying those examples into Title VI, the measure threatens to chill constitutionally protected speech. Speech that is critical of Israel alone does not constitute wrongful discrimination. Help us understand the Title VI that's referenced here. Well, yeah, I never thought I'd agree with uh, Congressman Nadler on, on much. So, but under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that ensures university or college programs or activities that receive federal funding do not discriminate based on uh, national origin, ancestry, characteristics, those type things. So under Title VI, those schools are already supposed to be doing that. So for example, if they have these groups that are calling for violence, they're calling for uh, death to Israel, all of these really horrible things, then those groups shouldn't be allowed to, to exist on campus. They should be investigated and expelled because they're trying to further a criminal act of, of uh, getting, getting these, you know, intimidating students, those type of things. So they sh that shouldn't be tolerated in the first place because it goes beyond First Amendment rights. So I do agree that Title VI is a mechanism already that already has mechanisms that can be enforced without adding to it. And I would be very concerned about giving the Department of Education more authority. Um, look, we've already seen what the Department of Education has done with, with gender. I mean, they've redefined gender. So we're going to give the Department of Education more authority to, uh, to investigate uh, students on, when they clearly can't even get biological sex correct. On that note, Congresswoman Harriet Hageman says the bill provides no actual relief for terrorized Jewish students and infringes on the First Amendment. The Washington Post is saying the bill would create a clear definition of anti-Semitism in U.S. law and then enable the Education Department to cut off funding to academic institutions that are found to tolerate such behavior. Based on that definition, do you think the bill will effectively address anti-Semitism on campuses? Well, not, not particularly. I think what will will address uh, uh, anti-Semitism is having chancellors and university presidents enforce the law and not allow, allow these things to get out of hand by enabling the Department of Education to give them more authority. Again, Congress delegating their authority to unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats to conduct investigations is not the answer. I mean, the answer is the rule of law and using the tools that are already in the toolkit. It is not lawful to prevent uh, students of Jewish ancestry to go to class. It is not lawful to threaten or intimidate. So there are laws on the books and these chancellors and presidents of these universities need to show leadership and show courage and doing the right thing is not always easy, but they need to do the right thing here. I'm just uh, very skeptical, skeptical of giving the Department of Education more authority, more deference, uh, especially when it comes to our constitutional rights. Jonathan Houlihan, General Counsel and Director of Legal Operations at Citizens Defending Freedom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The House Judiciary Committee today held a field hearing in a city of Philadelphia. Lawmakers heard testimony from experts and family members of victims of violent crime. NTD's Luis Martinez has the story. 
We're here right in front of Independence Hall and right behind the William J. Green Federal Building where the House Judiciary Committee just held its field hearing focusing on victims of violent crime here in the city of Philadelphia. House Republicans focused also on what they called the pro-criminal leading in policies of District Attorney Larry Krasner. Let's listen to what Congressman Jim Jordan, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, had to say about this. Simply put, Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner is failing to prosecute criminals. Since his tenure began, Krasner's office has consistently declined to prosecute crimes in the city. Notably, the policies include not seeking cash bail for most cases, considering a defendant's immigration status in the plea bargaining process, and not prosecuting crimes like prostitution or marijuana possession. House Republicans presented a flurry of evidence, like for example, that during DA Larry Krasner's first term, uh, starting in 2018, homicide rates went up 78%. Also that apparently Larry Krasner, the DA of Philadelphia, had instructed his attorneys not to prosecute with misdemeanors or felonies those criminals caught uh, stealing or shoplifting merchandising under $500. We also heard from experts like Nick Garachi, a former Philadelphia police officer who called DA Larry Krasner a serial killer by proxy. He prioritizes the pursuit of his ideological agenda over public safety. Let him go Larry has put the lives of Philadelphia residents at risk, or Uncle Larry as the criminal underground in Philadelphia refers to him so lovingly. Democratic ranking member Congressman Jared Nadler from New York lamented that the House Judiciary Committee was not working from Washington, D.C., and accused Republicans of politicizing this hearing. Our time would be better spent again back in D.C. passing bills that can help support Philadelphia and all our communities to be safer places for every American. We also heard from Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon, the Democrat from Pennsylvania, who accused House Democrats of hosting a traveling circus. Instead, he's brought his traveling circus to town in order to divide Americans, scare voters, influence elections, and distract from the crushing failure of the House majority to govern. Republicans and Democrats threw competing statistics throughout the hearing, but one statistic that held firm was last year's murder rate. In Philadelphia in 2023, over 400 people were violently murdered, which is of serious concern to local authorities. Reporting from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. TD Bank was allegedly involved in moving fentanyl money for Chinese money launderers. This is according to a Wall Street Journal report. Federal agents say tactics being employed here have become more sophisticated. NTD's Dave Martin has more. TD Bank helping China launder fentanyl money, according to the Justice Department. The Wall Street Journal reports an operation was uncovered in New York and New Jersey, which laundered hundreds of millions of dollars in illegal drug money via TD Bank and other banks. This is according to court files and people in the know. Chinese money laundering organizations have gotten very good at shielding ill-gotten gains. These organizations launder cartel cash quicker and cheaper than competitors, often with a money-back guarantee. During a hearing on Chinese money laundering Tuesday, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse said that Chinese money laundering organizations work with Mexican cartels to move fentanyl profits. The Journal reports, according to court files in 2021, federal agents followed suspects through New York City streets as they carried giant bags of cash bank to bank. On one occasion, they even caught suspects bribing TD employees. They can uh, you know, make them look the other way uh, when opening bank accounts using a fictitious uh, high-quality Chinese passports. Federal investigator Ricardo Mayoral told lawmakers he's often seen these organizations engaging in bribery, which bypasses traditional detection systems. The other thing that they're using uh, a, by placing a, a members of the organization within the bank branches is to not only monitor the account, but to control and change the addresses once the bank accounts are open. In the Justice Department probe, the Chinese laundering organization offered $57,000 in bribes to TD employees. This included gift cards. The organization moved at least $653 million to thousands of entities in the U.S. and Hong Kong, according to court documents. 
The Justice Department is also investigating TD Bank for three other instances of money laundering. A Canadian regulator fined it nearly $7 million on Wednesday. TD Bank said Thursday it's cooperating with law enforcement and strengthening its anti-money laundering program. This is Dave Martin for NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot happening in sports, but let's start in the NBA, where the Lakers fired head coach Darwin Ham today. Was this an expected move? Well, it was certainly a long rumored move. I mean, Ham was their head coach the last two seasons. They made the playoffs both times as a seven seed. They lost the Denver Nuggets actually both times as well. The franchise, though, had higher expectations than that, especially on a team of superstars LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Now, remember the guy uh, Ham replaced, Frank Vogel. He was fired just two years after winning the NBA championship. I think they're also hoping to make a splash here to convince LeBron James to return. Now, James's future is up to him. He can retire, he can opt out of his contract and become a free agent, sign with any other team, or he can exercise his player option next year with LA for like 50 something million dollars. I get the feeling he only wants to play for a winner. The Lakers are gonna try their best to convince him that that's them. Tonight in the NBA playoffs, we have a pair of games on, including game six of the Mavericks Clippers series. What is the status of Clippers all-star Kawhi Leonard? Yeah, he's still listed as out for tonight. This will be the third straight game he misses after also missing games two and three in this series. This time, though, the LA's backs are against the wall. They're down 3-2. They're coming off a blow -off, blowout loss in Dallas. I think they bounce back, though, with a win at home tonight and force a Game 7. Now, in the second game tonight, Orlando hosts Cleveland. They're down 3-2. Now, the home team has won every game in this series, but this series has kind of been like the opposite of that Philly-New Philly, Philly New York series, which was really thrilling, where every game was a back-and-forth contest down to the final seconds. This series is close in games, but none of the games have really been close, except for maybe Game 5. In any case, I think Orlando forces a Game 7 here as well. Shifting gears to hockey, we have a similar situation. A pair of Game 6s tonight, including one where the defending Stanley Cup champions are settling on the ropes. What happened with Vegas? I know. They, they won their first two games against Dallas in Dallas, but now they've lost three in a row, including two at home. Now, they've already switched goalies uh, with Aiden Hill in for Game 5. It looks like he'll also get the start tonight despite losing. Now, he was their goalie during last year's playoff run when they won the Stanley Cup championship. Obviously, they're hoping for the same spark from him again here. The winner here will face Colorado next. And if it is Vegas, if they win two in a row here, it'll be a matchup the last two NHL champions. Now, in the second game tonight, we have Vancouver versus Nashville. Nashville is down 3-2 here, but the Predators will be at home tonight, which actually may not be great news. I mean, the road team has actually won four of the five games in this series as well. Now, the winner of this series will advance to face Edmonton then in round two. Tomorrow is the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby. What makes this particular horse race such a popular event? You know, I think it's a number of things, really. You know, it's a whole day event for those who actually attend. I mean, the race itself is over in the blink of an eye. You know, it's known as the fastest two minutes in sports. And that's about as long as it takes for this to run. The winner gets that huge blanket of hundreds of roses. Very unique. In fact, the race has also been nicknamed the run for the roses. And it's also a big socialite event. I mean, Queen Elizabeth II used to attend this all the time. It's also unique in that you only have one chance to run it because this, is, this race is only for three-year-old horses. Of course, a lot of money changes hands here as well. There's a $5 million total purse, including more than $3 million for the winner. Now, the two big betting favorites for tomorrow's race are Fierceness at 2.5 to 1 odds and Sierra Leone at 3 to 1. So, better get out there and place your bets. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. A new exhibition exploring the last decades of Michelangelo's life and work is opening in London. The prolific artist continued to produce art right up until the final days of his life. Michelangelo is the soaring talent behind the awe-inspiring ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and the statue of David. But this new exhibition at the British Museum wants to look at a different period of his life, his older years. It's easy for people to forget that he goes on working until the age of almost 89. And the later works show quite a different side to him, much more introspective, much more thoughtful. Religious iconography plays a huge part in the exhibition, perhaps reflecting the artist's faith and his contemplation of his own mortality. 
we get to see more of him as a person coming to terms with these very universal human feelings that we all face as we get older trying to weigh up if you've lived a good life and meditating on aspects of faith which he hopes will bring him to salvation. The show includes some rare gems. The two-metre-high Epiphania is on public display for the first time since restoration began on it in 2018. It is of unique distinction today because the cartoon Michelangelo makes, the one-to-one -one drawing, um, the blueprint essentially, is the only cartoon, complete cartoon, that survives in Michelangelo's hand. Visitors can see early workings of some of his famous compositions, like studies for figures that would eventually appear in The Last Judgment, a fresco covering the altar of the Sistine Chapel. Then there are black chalk and lead white drawings made shortly before his death decades later, which show how his style had evolved with age. He becomes slightly more interested in the spiritual interior of the figures that he represents. The figures often become a little more compact, a little more dense and weighty. At the same time, when he is dealing with the figure of Christ, for example, it can become quite light, almost ethereal. His letters give an insight into Michelangelo's life beyond the art. He writes to his nephew to thank him for wine sent from the family farm. One letter written on his behalf bears what is said to be Michelangelo's last known signature, four days before his death. Increasingly, that beautiful handwriting starts to become more and more shaky. Um, and I find it very, very moving when you look at the last signature to see a hand that had, you know, glided a pen across a sheet of paper with such effortless virtuosity, even struggling to write his own name. A sketch of his plans for the dome of the Vatican's St. Peter's Basilica shows his design abilities were as sharp as ever, even though he likely knew he would never live to see its construction. Michelangelo, The Last Decades, opens on Thursday and runs until the end of July. And that's all for today's news. For round-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.